At one o'clock, hacking the iPod. At two o'clock, why forensics sucks. At three o'clock, Python TCP IP stack. And at four o'clock, media streaming. The other announcements, uh, if you have, All right, if you would please hold your questions till the end, and if you wouldn't mind, use the microphone. We're not gonna point the camera at the microphone, so don't worry, but when this uh, goes out on the archive on the web, we don't want you know thousands of hackers and 30 or 40 law enforcement officers straining to hear your questions. So we can get those, and everybody will hear them, and it'll be good. That's it, and without further ado, we have Laurent Odo to speak about retaliation with honeypots. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Laurent Do. I'm coming from France, and I work um, for the French equivalent of the Department of Energy, US Department of Energy. Uh, I am a member of the team called RSTACK, where you can find everything on rstack.org. And uh, also, I am one of the members of uh, the steering committee of the HoneyNet project, which is led by Len Spisner. So today, we're going to talk about retaliation with a honeypot. So that should be funny. <coughs> so at first, we begin with a very easy question. What is a honeypot, in case people here wouldn't know? Um, is there any, anybody here who has ever deployed a honeypot? No? OK, cool. Then we'll be able to talk about retaliation with a honeypot, and which is the core of the presentation. and with two more bonus, which is adding poison in the honey and monitoring the trap. Um, well, well, I will show you uh, logs, example of logs uh, from a honeypot. And then we'll be able to conclude. <coughs> so first, what is a honeypot? As I know, this is Sunday, and this is very early for geeks. Uh, for me, this is very early. Um, um, what's that? What can you see? A truck, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, those are fakes. Uh, it comes from Fortitude, wi which was a code, a code name given to the decoy operation mounted by the Allies to deceive the Germans about the date and above all the place of the landing for the D-Day, you know. Uh, this is uh, the birthday of uh, the, 60, uh, the 16th birthday for that. Uh, so deception worked and will work, okay. And honeypots are security resources that might be used to delude at attackers. If we look at the definition uh, proposed by Lance Pisner, uh, the leader of the HoneyNet project, he said that honeypots are computer resources whose value lies in unauthorized or illicit use of that resource. So they are built to be uh, attacked, uh, scanned, probed, uh, compromised. So how can you build your own toy? to play with uh, aggressors. You, can <coughs> you have to create non-production networks and devices, systems used to delude the attackers. For example, you can build a fake company or a fake association, something like that. You have to log everything, system activity, network activity, uh, because, for example, you would like to grab the exploits of the evil attacker and uh, <laughs> and the rootkits, and stuff like that. And it works, really. Then, one of our cool things with honeypots is that uh, while the people will attack your honeypots, they won't attack your production system. So, but th this is very risky because you have to protect this specific infrastructure. For example, what would happen if the honeypot is used to bounce, for example, on uh, pentagon.gov or something like that, I don't know. So you will be the source of the attack. So this is very difficult to deal with the outbound traffic from your honeypot. And then you just have to wait and see and look at attackers losing time, etc. So more about honeypots. Um, if, if you think about deploying honeypots, uh, take care of legal issues. For example, in some countries, uh, you might have problem with entrapment, tracking, recording, privacy. For example, what if you are recording everything in your honeypot and that black hats uh, decide to have uh, discussions uh, in your honeypot? 
if you are recording this discussion, is it legal or illegal? So just it, d it depends of your country. And for example, um, you have to check on uh, the honeynet.org website, for example. And also, I talked about that uh, just before. What if an attacker uses your honeypot to jump elsewhere? That's, that's the main problem. Also, we have technical issues, like you have to harden the network uh, to avoid bounces. Um, you have to deal with stealth problems. For now, the black hat people uh, just want to try to fingerprint your honeypot. They want to know if this is a honeypot. For example, is it a VMware? They will try to look at that. Uh, they will try to, to see if they can access the ring zero. They will try to look if there is uh, traffic on the network, uh, system activities and stuff like that. So that's, that might be difficult. And also, you need time to monitor the box and analyze intrusions. So some managers say that Honeypot sucks because they don't have time to look at the logs of, of their real uh, production system. Uh, why would they add something else? Uh, <coughs> I don't know. Uh, from a philosophical or psychological uh, point of view, people say, do you really want to play with aggressors? What if, for example, a black hat see that this is a Honeypot, uh, will he strike back or something like that? Well, I don't know, I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, if you want more information about Honeypot, just join the Alliance on honeynet.org. Um, okay, so <coughs> um, who knows Honeydee? Nobody? Okay, Honeydee is a pretty cool open source project which is led by Nis Provost, a member of the Honeynet project. And this is a Unix diamond that will help you at creating thousands and thousands on, of fake computers and fake services on only one computer. And this is very cool because it can fool tools like Nmap and Xprob. And for example, you can build with, uh, I don't know, a uh, few, uh, few lines of uh, configuration. You can build, for example, a fake cluster of PlayStation 2. <laughs> that's, that's quite funny. You can imagine someone uh, from a foreign country attacking your fake cluster and see, oh, dude, there is a, a PlayStation 2 cluster. That's strange. <coughs> yeah, but everything is fake. So if the attacker send an exploit, we grab the exploit, and that's, that's quite funny. So <coughs> this is very easy also to simulate arbit uh, arbitrary routing topologies and th stuff like that. Um, to show you, for example, as you might see, fr from the network, when packets come uh, down to HoneyD, um, it, it comes through uh, lip pickup, and then there is a virtual IP stack uh, that deals with packets. And depending on the type of packets, uh, for example, if this is TCP and UDP, and if Honeyd want to simulate a fake service to delude the aggressor, then <coughs> uh, Honeyd will launch an external program that will deal with the aggressor and simulate a service. Then when packets will go out of the honeypot, it will go through um, something that is called the personality engine to fool, for example, tools like Nmap or Xprob. Okay? <coughs> so, to configure Honeyd, this is very easy. You just have to focus on creation. Go create. Imagine what could be your own fake network and systems and just write a configuration. For example, I would like a fake box with Linux on 192. Uh, 168.1.22 uh, with a fake email server and fake suite server and whatever. You just have to create, for example, create a template, say the personality will be a Linux kernel uh, with this version. Uh, I would like a fake email service on port 25. So just launch a uh, fake sendmail.pl uh, script, for example. I would like a fake squid, I would like a fake proxy and whatever. You just have to create. That's very easy. You should try. <coughs> so how work the fake services? As you can see, the attacker, for example, will try to, um, to play and talk with your honeypots and say, for example, hello, site.com. I'm a fucking spammer, and I want to send a thousand and thousand of spam. OK. <laughs> Honeyd will say, OK, there is um, a spammer. Um, oh, there, is, there is someone who wants to talk with my fake uh, send mail service, he will, uh, it will launch the 
fake uh, external send mail script. And this fake external script just have to deal with input and output. For example, uh, if I receive hello, then I will write something. If I receive a mail from, I will write something. And this is, as you might see, this is very easy to uh, write your own fake service. Then it will launch, for example, the answer, uh, send the answer, and HoneyD will uh, finally send the final answer uh, with, um, in case this is needed, uh, changes uh, in TCP and IP, uh, for example, headers for personality uh, issues. And the attacker will really think that he is talking to a sendmail script. <coughs> so, this introduction was just here to help you at understanding what are honeypots. But the core of the presentation is retaliation with honeypots. So, I'm pretty happy to be here at the Hope Conference to talk about that because, um, uh, for example, in France, uh, we have restriction of laws and this is not clear for now, uh, till June, uh, if this is legal or not to talk about stuff like that. Uh, for example, you don't have the right to get exploited on your own computers and stuff like that. But I won't talk about that here. If you want to talk, just come on, <coughs> but offline. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> during the last can sequest in Vancouver, um, I made a talk which was called Towards Evil Honeypots. Um, when they bite back. So, uh, this presentation will uh, strongly use slides from uh, what I show uh, during uh, Consequest Core 04. So, I said that evil honeypots are computer resources that are able to counterattack or play with an aggressor by using specific self defense techniques. You know, active defense, countermeasure, uh, counterattack. We're not just talking about fighting off. We are, ju we are also talking about fighting back, okay? So imagine something like the aggressor that will attack your evil honeypot, and the evil honeypot will say, okay, if you touch me, I touch you, okay? <laughs> and we th it will hack back. I will show you an example just after that. <coughs> Don't tell the feds. Okay, why would we play with retaliation? At first, you could say, you could argue that people have the right to protect themselves, okay? And you could say that self-defense should be accepted. Uh, of course, this is very difficult because self-defense is not something, um, this is only most of the time something for physical threats. And this is very difficult to um, <coughs> talk about that for the digital world. And also, this is very difficult to do clean uh, retaliation uh, because, um, for example, in the U.S., you don't have the right to um, protect yourself if you had uh, another solution. So how could you prove that you had no other alternative solutions? Uh, that's very difficult. And also, your answer, your counter-attack, counter has to be uh, proportional to the attack. What is proportional? For example, uh, if you get a DOS, a denial of service. What, what is proportional? A DOS? Well, why not? But you, you don't know. And also, if you attack back uh, a computer of a victim that was hacked, for example, I don't know, that's, that could be a, a very big cluster uh, playing with uh, codes uh, to fight, for example, human disease. You will hack back uh, such a computer, and that's not funny, okay? So, as you might see, retaliation is funny from a technical point of view. But I am a geeky, but uh, also I'm aware of uh, legal issues, so think about that uh, if you look um, at those stuff. So while I c with the white hat community might be interesting in retaliation, for example, to stop specific kind of attacks like worms, and also to trust, stop, monitor by internal user or attackers. Of course, uh, this is very interesting, but we have to be aware that retaliation could be used by black hat people, for example, to commit automatic crime. Um, imagine uh, if you put a honeypot that will hack back uh, any com incoming client, uh, that's something that will automatically uh, attack uh, clients. So that's, that's something very bad. 
Why I am I talking about honeypots? Because there are non-production resources. So incoming traffic might be considered as suspicious and should be considered as an aggression because this is a non-production system. That's why this is very cool to put something like retaliation on a honeypot. Because being evil with an aggressor might be considered as self-defense. Might be also, I said. So hacking back, the trouble is you have to think about spoofing. Are you sure that the attackers are those you want to hack back? You might attack innocent, and um, first casualty of war is innocent. You remember Platoon? And um, what is the real source of the aggression? Those questions are very difficult. And also, um, imagine if hackback uh, come uh, become uh, legal, um, how will you be able to prove that uh, uh, there were an incoming aggression? For example, if you had a line in your logs saying that, yes, pentagon.gov uh, attacked me, uh, that's why I hack back, that's totally stupid, okay? And you should go in jail. So, the proof of incoming aggression will become something very difficult. And also, imagine if everybody puts something like hackback on the internet, automatic hackback may lead to chaos, okay? So, think twice before playing like that. Um, but hackback could be used for internal problems. Um, of course, you have the right to pen test your own computers in your company uh, most of the time. So, if you have the right to pen test your computer, your own computers, computers that are under your legal, uh, legal, um, uh, you, you, you see what I mean. Um, you have the right to pen test, so you, you have the right to attack those hosts. So, you might have the right to, um, for example, hack back an end user, I don't know, a Zillo trainee trying to get a specific secret file in your company, for example. Um, but hackback might be very difficult for external problem and you might need co cooperation, for example, state between states or companies and stuff like that. Um, if we talk about the risk of spoofing, um, everybody knows the uh, idle scan, for example, I suppose. Yes, no? Uh, idle scan is just an example where um, the aggressor will talk with the target without being known. For example, the aggressor just have to send a scene by spoofing a host that I called zombie, and the target will answer with a or reset, for example, to the zombie. Then the aggressor will just have to talk with the zombie with a, fake with a small CNAC which is uh, called an IPID IP ID probe, and the zombie will send a reset. And depending on the fact that um, the target uh, in the phase two uh, sent a CNAC or reset, uh, the IP ID will change on the zombie for the reset response, and the aggressor will know if the port on the target was open or not. And as you might see, the aggressor did not talk with the target. So, but this is just uh, called the uh, idle scan. But this is an example of a um, funny uh, way to attack without uh, being seen. And the trouble with hacking back is that uh, that might be dangerous to hack back anybody because you are not sure of the source of aggressor. So, let's talk about retaliation with honeypots. Uh, the idea is Imagine someone which is doing uh, something bad against your honeypot and you want to react. First, we could try, for example, to buy back usual clients coming to, uh, for example, your fake web server, trying to do SQL injection or stuff like that. What if the clients used by the attacker are vulnerable or misconfigured? For example, if you look at web clients like Internet Explorers, and uh, uh, SSH clients, mail clients, DNS server, IRC clients, whatever. They are all vulnerable, okay? Or at least they are vulnerable or they have been vulnerable and in the future they will be vulnerable. Uh, the question is, is it possible to do something like a remote control or rem a remote crash to, for example, fight back someone that tried to um, 
um, attack you. So I played with something um, just to see if it was possible. Um, with, for example, uh, this is very old, this is two years old uh, stuff. Um, it was with SSH clients. Most of the time on distro like Linux distribution with SSH clients, um, it was built, the clients were built with X11 forwarding active. Do you know what it is? Yeah? Okay. So on the Honeypot, and that was very easy with HoneyD to play like that, um, when the display localhost um, 10, um, wh when someone connected to my Honeypot, because he knew, uh, for example, uh, a, a real login and a real password on my Honeypot, uh, which is something that he uh, found with uh, another bug on my web server. Um, the display localhost 10 was the equivalent of the remote uh, zero. So the localhost on my honeypot port 6010 is automatically forwarded in the SSH session. And at that time, I could play with something like XWD or XPy because by attacking um, to uh, attacking the remote TCP port uh, 6000 uh, was very easy because by attacking the local port uh, forwarded by SSH, your attack was automatically, uh, automatically forwarded uh, to the attacker. So with that, um, you could get, for example, um, you had a, a ciphered um, attack against the attacker this, it was a funny hackback. You could get the attacker screens dump on the honeypot, and also you could get uh, everything typed by the attacker. So you had a kind of remote keylogger active. So that was funny because he saw that it was a FreeBSD and uh, he went on uh, security focus and tried to find um, bugs. So that's quite funny because. Um, most of the time, you will see that the black hat will try, for example, uh, they, will, they will get a, uh, an exploit that they don't understand. They will send this exploit towards your computers. They will get a shell. And after that, they will uh, type the uh, very funny command, you name dash A, and say, oh, okay, uh, now I want to be root. And so they will go on a s web server uh, with uh, services, uh, uh, give, uh, giving them exploits to, uh, for example, abus, bugs in the kernel and stuff like that. So that's funny because the, the, <laughs> the black hat didn't know that he was spied. Another question. Uh, th this is very difficult to buy back incoming clients because, um, for example, you have uh, two kind of clients. You have what I, I have called listening clients, like May client, etc. Uh, this is very easy because you, you have multiple times. For example, if you want to hack back a mail client, you can send uh, multiple mails. But most of the time, people use, for example, incoming, incoming client, like web clients, stuff like that. And this is a one-shot operation. And sometimes the hackback can occur during a specific phase. For example, during the negotiation of a login password on a FTP server and something like that. And also, you need specific information to launch a dedicated attack uh, against the client. For example, you need to know the operating system. Uh, you need to know the version and stuff like that. Um, at the end, uh, this is an example of um, uh, a hackback of a putty client. Uh, you know, this is SSH for uh, Windows. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, it was trying to, send, uh, to launch a remote exec uh, on the client. So that's very difficult, but that might, that might exist. Another question is, is it possible to exploit the exploit? Imagine someone launching an exploit against you, and, the guy, and you get a shell on the guy, on the script key. That's funny. So the question is, is what if there is a vulnerability in the code of an exploit? Um, you know, like a buffer flow, a string format. So do you hear? read the code of the exploit before launching it? I'm pretty sure that the answer is no. And I am also pretty sure that the answer is I don't read the payload also <laughs> most of the time. And you know, 
uh, some people put funny stuff in the payload, like format the remote host or <laughs> format the local host or something like that. So um, script kiddies don't understand the sources of the exploits they use. We we can we can see sometimes on the internet people coming on uh, ERC, IRC saying uh, when I launch the decom uh, exp exploit dot c uh, it did it did not work <laughs> what can I do uh, did you compile it uh, compile what do you mean okay <laughs> go away <coughs> so I'm pretty sure that script kiddies don't understand the exploits they use and if you look at the code sometimes you can see exploits but. This is like for the web client and stuff like that. This is very difficult. Um, if you look at automatic tools used to launch remote attacks or audits, they are written properly. For example, if you look at Nisus, uh, they created something which is called an ESL uh, to get something like a small sandbox while launching uh, uh, security probes. And also for Core Impact, which is a very cool tool, this is written in Python. And also they have something like <coughs> a use of small privilege and um, some kind of sandbox. And they probably did that because they know that uh, there is a risk. So that might exist also. What about scanners? Uh, there are many kind of scanners that are used in the wild, like network layers, banners, security tests. And some of them are poorly designed from a security point of view and might lead to insecurity. Um, we saw my friend, we saw buffer overflow possible uh, and from a strings against scanners. For example, we saw, scan we saw uh, I, w I won't give the name uh, because of the MCA restriction and stuff like that, but we saw scanners, uh, for example, w trying to get to grab your banner of your uh, FTP server and waiting for something which had um, 1024 uh, uh, bytes, okay, and if your uh, FTP server had a very big banner, uh, you know, I am a FTP server, FTP server, FTP server, FTP server, FTP server, <laughs> and which was um, too big, uh, you had a possibility to make a buffer overflow on the client, on the <laughs> on the scanner. So that's quite funny because this is a reverse of usu this usual game uh, on the internet, and also we saw some reports badly generated, for example, with HTML, including banners grab on the target without checking data. So you could put, for example, a banner from your FTP server with a JavaScript code inside of it. And when the evil script kiddie was trying to look at the security report, uh, you could launch code on his computer. And that's quite funny. So, for scanners, that might be possible. What about clients of Trojan horses? What if there is a vulnerability in the code of a Trojan horse client? How many times here, administrators, did you get an incoming prompt for Trojan ports toward your internal network? For me, that's every day, every day, every day, uh, every hour, uh, we have so many probes. So, imagine an evil honeypot that would be able to answer to the uh, client and say, yes, I am a Troy and a house server. I'm waiting for your orders. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> then a counter attack might be possible. Here is an example, technical example with HoneyD. That's why I show you HoneyD at the beginning. By adding a very easy line of configuration, which is add template TCP port 12345, launch the fake NetBus Perl script, which is uh, in the back, um, you add a NetBoost server on your fake computer. And here is the code of a um, fake remote NetBoost um, server that will answer um, to the client. And you, as you can see, when the client connects, it just says, yes, I am a NetBoost server 1.6, <laughs> which means what should I do? And if, if the client, for example, click on the button, I choose get info, but I could do it for every button. Then um, the fake um, NetBoost server uh, sent, for example, 100,000 uh, A and, uh, <laughs> and was waiting for the answer of uh, the client. And here is what happened. 
So first, the NetBoost client is connected. So you can imagine the script kiddie, hey, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I get one, I get a new one. I, I found a NetBoost server on the internet. Then by clicking on the get info, as you can see on the picture number two, the CPU went <laughs> uh, increased to 100%. Uh, and then, a few seconds after that, as you might see, um, this is an undefined state for the NetBoost client. Okay, so this is not something like you get a shell on the attacker, but you killed the application that tried to attack, for example, your company. So I don't know if this can be called um, proportional answer, but that's very interesting from a technical point of view. <laughs> I think that the, the script kiddie w was afraid when he saw that. <coughs> so <coughs> another question is, is it possible to fight back worms? For example, imagine in your company, on your internal network, you have a, a very big problem like a worm. Uh, remember, uh, sadly, summer uh, last year with DCOM um, exploit and um, the MS Blast worm. Um, it was uh, very horrible for uh, many companies uh, in the world. So the question is, is it possible to fight back worms? So this is something I wrote in Security Focus. You can find uh, find it. I wrote a paper on securityfocus.com, uh, which was called Fighting Internet Worms with Honeypot. And also I made a presentation during the Black Hat in Asia, Singapore, uh, on th that subject. But um, to show it very fastly, uh, here is a theory. Imagine uh, we have a worm called W that comes, uh, W is for worm, huh? this is not for something else. <laughs> I'm not talking about political things, okay? Uh, so <coughs> a worm called W comes from a host called A to a host co called H, H because this is a honeypot. I say that for people who are sleeping, <laughs> okay? Um, so A is infected by W, okay? Because A is trying, for example, to um, propagate itself uh, to H, okay? So A is, or was, it might depend, vulnerable to the attack used by the worm. So A may still be vulnerable. So what if H, the honeypot, attacks A through this vulnerability? It means that the honeypot can take the control of um, the, the host that is infected by the worm. So what if the honeypot takes control of the host infected by the worm by using this vulnerability and try to clean the host, to patch the host, and to harden the host, and for example, to reboot? Then, only with ho one honeypot, uh, we you can clean thousands and thousands of computers. The trouble is, as, uh, <coughs> as I said, uh, is it legal? Uh, we, we can say that, for example, <coughs> when I wrote that, um, uh, I was also uh, slash dotted uh, because of that. Um, people said this is this is forbidden to hack back. I said yes, this might be forbidden, but uh, on your legal uh, own internal network, you can play with that, and you can save uh, hours and hours by just few lines of code. For example, those are lines of code with Honeyd. To this is a proof of concept. Uh, that show uh, that shows how to fight off uh, and even fight back uh, an MS Blast worm on a network. That's very easy. It, you just have to say, I want to launch this script when a worm is trying to uh, when MS Blast is trying to come on my computer, my honeypot, and then uh, here is the code. The code is just okay. S send an evil exploit towards the incoming um, uh, worm infected computer and uh, then you have a shell, and then you try to, uh, li this is for uh, XP, uh, Windows XP, you try, for example, to uh, task kill the msblast.exe process, then you try to delete the file of the worm, then you try to um, clean the registry, then you uh, try to reboot the host and stuff like that. So as, as you might see, this is very easy, okay? <coughs> you can do very, very cool things like that. What about the wireless threat? Um, I wrote a paper about wireless honeypot, well it was called wireless honeypot trickery on securityfocus.com and 
I talk about the fact that there are evil honeypots in the wireless world. Yes. Um, sometimes you can you can see, for example, an official access point with fake resources. For example, here, if someone launch uh, uh, something with a SSID, uh, which is hope um, dash zero five, I think, um, on channel three, for example, uh, with a very big signal, what will happen, for example? Um, some people might think that this is a real network, but it might be a fake one. So <coughs> sometimes we can see rogue access points, um, which are used in the wide to attack, to automatically attack clients. Uh, because th the problem, for example, if you if you take a train, your manager, you open your laptop, you don't know that you have a wireless card in the in uh, for example in your computer, and uh, while you are traveling. Uh, an evil guy uh, in the train, for example, will launch uh, a fake access point, and your computer, Windows XP, which is so kind with you, will automatically connect itself to the fake access point and say, I want an IP address. So the fake access point, we just have, here is your IP address. And imagine what will happen if, for example, uh, this manager uh, don't have a personal firewall on this computer. Uh, uh, something like LSSS uh, or DCOM exploit and stuff like that will probably work. And um, by traveling in only one hour or two hours, uh, all his um, sensitive data will be taken out from the computer. So, and also um, we can see in the wireless world stuff like war drivers trying to open access points and stuff uh, and playing and trying to create tunneling and to go, to freely go out on the internet. So um, there is an example of tool, who knows the tool called NSTX, yeah, okay? And um, this cool, this is very cool, I don't know how do you find it. This is a very cool tool that allows you to surf and to use the internet with stupid access points without paying, okay? Um, the idea is, most of the time, on some access point, um, you have the right to do DNS uh, queries. What if you query your own DNS server somewhere on the internet, and this is and use not really um, real questions of DNS, but specific DNS questions, which are uh, in fact IP over DNS. And it, it exists. This is called NSTX, and this is very easy to, to use. So, uh, when we looked uh, on that with uh, my friends from the, the team uh, RSTICK, uh, we found that this uh, server could be crashed remotely with a heavy on uh, with something like only one line of per. Uh, so that's very easy. Uh, it was for for the um, first version of NSTX. This is just to show you that. There is a threat, or there was a threat. The threat was, what if people use something like NSTX and uh, by working on the tools used by your enemy, you can find vulnerabilities and easily create your own possibilities to fight to fight off. Um, so now let's look at what can be done in the honeypot. For example, sometimes people try to steal files in your honeypot. Okay, so what if the gifts are trapped? For example, what if an attacker will download, read, and launch, for example, tools uh, from your honeypot, like Evil Exe or Evil Doc files? <laughs> so, imagine what if you if you put something like I don't know, uh, Britney.mp3 uh, um, or Britney.exe uh, or <laughs> something like that. Uh, if if um, this is a young attacker, he will probably take the file and bring it back to home to show and to look it with um, to look at it with his friends on Saturday night. Hey, look! I got a Britney.exe file. That might be cool. Yeah, that's cool. Launch it. <laughs> <coughs> and there is a pattern technology which is um, coming from a commercial. Um, 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 product which is called Spectre 7 that would add markers on the attacking hosts. 
for a potential, potential trial, but I, I've never tested it. So we could imagine something like, um, this is um, an exploit written by someone from, uh, from my team. Um, uh, he, wrote, he wrote an exploit that allows you to get a remote shell on someone looking at a Word document that you gave him. So imagine you create something called superclassified.doc uh, file in a dot secret uh, directory and you just have to wait that the script kitty take it and read it at home. <laughs> That's funny. You can get a shell on the, on the guy. So some people talk about the possibility uh, for the RAA honeypot. Um, okay, I won't comment it um, because uh, I don't want to have problem. Um, as you can see on the internet, on securityfocus.com, there is something written by Goebbels. They said, we focus on creating very warm hybrids to infect and spread over P2P nets. So uh, the question is, still this album, does it mean uh, be compromised? We don't know. Uh, this might be something, uh, I mean, honeypot to fight back uh, might be something that will be used uh, by people that want to fight P2P clients and stuff like that. So I won't say this is wrong or this is not wrong. I'm not here for political discussion, but just technical uh, discussion. So let's talk about monitoring the trap, and we're gonna have fun. So um, something that might be very useful for you is trying to uh, do um, to trust back um, the attacker. So you want to gather extended information about the attacker. Um, this might be very useful on local network. If there is not too much filtering on your internal network, um, sometimes if you see um, a Zillo trainee or someone on your network, for example, um, you by just um, requesting uh, or just asking questions to remote service, you will be able to find extended information about the attacker or the guy who is trying to play on a network. For example, you can use stuff like finger uh, users, identity. Uh, here is an example with HoneyD, a small HoneyD script to um, to query uh, a remote uh, identity. You can ask, for example, a NetBIOS uh, uh, server who is connected to this computer and stuff like that. But that's very easy, that's very simple. Uh, but there are also some other possibilities. Um, if you try to look at um, network um, possibilities, you will see that um, you can do advanced backtracking. For example, you can do active or passive fingerprinting with Honeypot. Most of the time, people talk about uh, passive uh, operating system uh, fingerprints. For example, with tools like HoneyD, like POF, or Nivo, which is a commercial tool, uh, very useful, um, or tools like ChronoRes, etc. You can do what is called, uh, for example, sometimes passive uh, operating system fingerprint because you want to gather the more information you can on the attacker. Okay, so here is a very um, easy example of uh, innovat innovative uh, active fingerprint, but that's that's very easy. You just have to play with what is called the close weight fingerprint HoneyD um, uh, fingerprint, and this is an example with HoneyD how to do that. As I, I don't have so much time. Um, I will let you look at the slides. The slide will be available online on my uh, website, rstic.org slash udo or udot. So to finish with a funny uh, story, here is the Truman Show honeypot. So the elite are inside the honeypot. So sometimes people want to talk with strangers, like, um, you know, we are always saying, know your enemy, you know, like Sun Tzu uh, uh, book. So if you want to know your enemy, w one of the best ways is to talk with the enemy. Uh, just go uh, to the show of Kevin and listen to uh, playing with deception with people and that's gonna be fun. And usually Black Hat get access, play and go away on your host. You don't have any opportunity to interact with them, but you would like to talk with them. So what can you do? That's funny. You can initiate discussion with the attackers. For example, to do human technical fingerprint, get more proofs, profile the attacker, get the location, uh, do exchanges, have fun, whatever. 
So you can use classical tools like write, talk, IRC, ICQ, and stuff like that. But on a honeypot, this might be very easy. For example, you want if you want to play with social engineering uh, with human aggressors, you can fool the attackers on your own computer. You can come and talk with the intruders and say, hi kid, I hacked this box too. I uh, want to share stuff. Uh, I have root access everywhere and stuff like that. The intruder will try to guess where you are from, okay? And if the discussion is on the honeypot, uh, the intruders will play with tools like Netstat, Who, W, PS, stuff like that, okay? But as this is your honeypot, you control the honeypot. This is your show, okay? So you can change everything, everything like the incoming IP address of your computer coming to your honeypot. So you, you just have to, for example, put a filtering computer that will change your incoming IP address with net, and you can change it to uh, spoof and to say that you come from a local LAN. Uh, uh, while coming from a local LAN, you can look like being uh, coming from uh, a .cn, .ru, whatever, okay? So this is very easy. On your gateway, you just have to use NAT and say, on the, on the gateway, uh, you just have to change the IP address, incoming IP address, and you can say, claim that you come from uh, wherever you want. If you want to say that you come from, uh, I don't know, uh, wireless.gov, uh, you, you, you can change the IP address, and the guy will, will th think that you are really coming from that. Here is a small script, um, from the French HoneyNet project, which is part of the HoneyNet Alliance, um, which is a true man show honeypot proof of concept. As you might see, this is just with IP tables to change the IP source. This is very easy. And here are logs coming from uh, one of uh, our uh, honeypots. So the black hat uh, that came on our honeypot uh, in installed a small bot, IRC bot, to uh, bounce to um, an IRC private server. Uh, of themselves. And we went from the honeypot on their IRC server and initiated a discussion and said, as you may see, uh, uh, they said, hello. And I said, hi, uh, I found this computer before you. <laughs> and the guy said, uh, I know. I said, how? And he said, uh, I did it faster than you. I said, mm, OK, let's try where I am from. <laughs> you know, that's the trick. He said France, because the honeypot is in France. And I said, no. So the intruder, very skilled, s launched a netstat-n to see who was really there, OK? And he got, a, he got my uh, fake IP address changed by the NAT. And so that it was coming from Singapore. And he said, Singapore. I said, of course, <laughs> which means welcome in the Truman Show honeypots, <laughs> OK? And it was quite funny because after a few minutes of discussion, I knew that they had fingerprinted that it was a VMware. And um, I knew that they were trying to crash the hard drive on my Omnipot. And also, uh, I understand uh, very easily um, that they were trying to, uh, for example, uh, abuse of sysread um, on my system and stuff like that. So that might be very funny to play like that. Here is conclusion. Um, there are other fields of interest, but we don't have so much time. Some people try to, to do something which, which is called boomerang effect. You proxy the aggression of the attacker back to the aggressor, which might be funny, and stuff like that. Audit the auditor and stuff like that. Okay. Um, in brief, Honeypot might play a role for retaliation, counterattack, or play with an aggressor by using specific self defense techniques. Uh, we talk about active defense, countermeasure, counterattack, stuff like that. Sometimes you can get a remote control. Uh, you can trap the attacker with poison gift. You can gather more information. You can crash the tools used by the attackers. For white hats, when this is legal, OK, I said, um, this, is, this might be useful to buy back aggressors. Um, for example, on your own land, I said, that might be um, very useful. For black hats, I must agree that uh, this might be a new way to passively attack incoming visitors. And I know that guys from uh, East Europe use uh, my techniques uh, to fight off MS Blast in order to get thousands and thousands of shells in August, last, uh, last August. Okay, But um, something which is something like 
biting back the aggressor uh, could be called the 69 attack. <laughs> okay, and as you might know, um, don't play 69 with someone you don't know. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so is it a future technology? I don't know. Will we have future law for that, or will be will it be integrated in our culture? I don't know. Uh, we might see. So, okay. Thank you very much, and <laughs> thanks for uh, for your attention. I would like to thank Dragos because he let me um, show that, and it's coming from uh, Consequest, uh, my previous Consequest conference. So if you have any question, just come on. Yes. Are there any distributions already set for a honey a honeypot on your website or anywhere on the internet? Yeah, the question is um, because you should talk in the mic. Uh, are there um, um, ready distribution uh, to play with honeypot? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, just come on on the website www.honeynet.org, and there is a new CD-ROM that will help you at creating very easily. Honeypot just with one uh, CD-ROM. With this CD-ROM, you will be able to create Honeypot in your company very easily. So just download it, launch it, you have the documentation, and that's very easy. OK. Another question? Uh, if you, for example, if you want to talk about that with me, uh, just write down my uh, email address. and. Uh, or ask the organizers, they will give uh, your m my address. And it will be a great pleasure for me to uh, share my ideas. This is what I came here to share my ideas. So, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Have fun.